Hey guys, this is an interview from a long time ago uh, when I was at Fantastic Fest back in September and I saw the movie The Standoff at Sparrow Creek. Uh, it's not necessarily a horror film, but it's still a pretty good little uh, thriller film. It's, it's you know, people trapped in a house um, and it's got a very like Quentin Tarantino vibe. I would say it's definitely for fans of especially early Tarantino, like uh, Reservoir Dogs and, and stuff like that. It's a all in one night, all in one location but with a lot of flashbacks to give you uh, an overview of what characters, inspirations and stuff are. So go and check out the movie. Uh, it's it's definitely a very good, fun time. But this is my sit down with the writer director, uh, Henry Dunham, who was just a delight. We had such a fun time talking. The movie is now available in select theaters, VOD and digital HD uh, on January 18th. So it's just around the corner. So check out this interview and then go check out the movie because I think a lot of you are really going to enjoy it. Also thinks that a lot. Um, TSA agents every time I fly. So. <laughs> uh, all right, so I'm sitting here with Henry, who did a film called Standoff at Sparrow Creek. Correct? That's correct. <laughs> so uh, this movie, I, I unfortunately wasn't able to catch a screening of it here at the convention, but I did get to watch a screener of it. Okay. Um, and it is, it's an intense movie, man. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, I yeah, think. Yeah, you wrote a very... It's a solid script. Uh, it's, I'm trying to think of the best way to word it, and I, I hate using other films as a means of comparison because it always feels like it's, it's okay. downplaying someone's creativity, but it's very... Uh, it made me feel a lot of how I felt when I watched Reservoir Dogs for uh -huh. the first time. Uh -huh. And I'm sure you've heard that before. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. But it, it does... I mean... Yeah, you know, you're being compared to Quentin, which is a huge compliment totally in its own right. Reserved. <laughs> but I'll, uh, yeah, I it it is interesting how much that movie's come up because I'm just like, well, is it because it's dudes in a warehouse or what? And and I get it, and it's like there's an undercover cop, but you you kind of just like have to accept it that he sort of has a monopoly on dudes in a warehouse movies yeah with undercover comics like well if you go down this road you're gonna get this so it's just accepting that. And I think it's the. Um, the other thing that I felt a lot with, uh, as far as like a potential influence, was actually a Twilight Zone episode, the, oh. the Monsters on Maple Street. You know, somebody else told me about that one, and I've never seen that one. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Oh, okay, but, yeah, okay. But it's the, you know, it's a movie that's kind of about paranoia and people's ability to create their own self-destructions. Yeah, okay. Uh, and that's what I think was really cool about it, and it's tied into this script with these brilliant dialogue scenes. There's a scene where, I don't want to give away anything in the movie, but there's, there's a scene where a character gives this monologue about a potential manifesto. Yeah, about a potential <laughs> manifesto that is just so intense as he's tied to a chair. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like yeah. The, the performance in that's fantastic. Where was your inspiration for making this, I guess? I'm throwing out my own ideas, but I haven't asked well, what yours are. <laughs> uh, well, it was a weird one. Um, so I had written and directed a short that was kind of like a cousin piece of this. It was two characters in the warehouse and a lot of dialogue and very kind of stage play-esque. And, you know, writing and directing is what I always wanted to do. And I did it and it was received very well and went online and, and you know, it was a proud moment. Yeah. And I went out with a friend to a bar where I live in Los Angeles and I kind of looked around and just saw it was the same shit, like one of those bars you're just like, it's just people rubbernecking and looking around and wondering who's who. And I was just like, what the fuck am I doing here? Yeah. And it was a very lonely moment. And I just left and was like, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to be isolated and I just want to work. And I tend to try and work from a position uh, on emotions that scare me. Yeah. And that one right there, I felt, okay, well, if that's the goal, 
the most painful thing that can happen isn't to live your life in solitude. It's to realize that you, you need the bar, even yeah. if you don't want it. You need human connection, even if it's painful, and to the ones that are hurting you. I was like, okay, that's interesting. Like, that's a storyline. That's something I can get behind. That's, a, that's an emotional through line I can track. And then from there going, okay, it is a very familiar arc. You see it in, you know, family dramas. You see it in a movie about a band or something. I was like, what is a very inaccessible story arena to set that? Somebody that, you know, a group that I don't have anything in common with, something that's very kind of alienated. And I was just like, oh, okay, I'm from Michigan originally. I always heard about these militia people. It'd be interesting to set a very familiar story in a very unfamiliar story arena. And that's really kind of how it went. And I just went from there. And I I feel like um, hearing that, I relate so much to... I was in L.A. for maybe six months. Mm. And, you know, the way you described feeling in that bar is kind of... I felt that way the whole time I was in L.A. I it's, felt very uncomfortable yeah. in my own skin yep. for the first time ever. Yep. Um, so I, I think that that's brilliant because you... You did the opposite of me. I ran away. I was like, all right, I'm going back home. Where well, you probably it. did the smart thing. I <laughs> stayed for 11 years. I don't know. You're the one being interviewed by me. So. <laughs> oh, it's funny. No, I mean, I think the residual effects, I'll probably be some weird old man just, you know, uh, dealing with the ripple effects of living for 11 years in LA. Well, you'll be fine and having like a nice family and kids. I heard someone once say that, uh, everyone in LA is just trying to become famous enough to no longer live in LA. You know what? That's a great, that's a great statement. And I think it's probably true. Yeah. There are so many great, sad, cynical statements about LA. I think there was one where it was like, it was like LA isn't a place to live. LA isn't a place you live. It's a carousel you try and stay on for as long as possible until you have to go home. And I was like, oh, God. <laughs> yeah, okay. Fair so, enough. So what, because I had trouble, I guess this is, would fall into a drama. We're, we're at Fantastic Fest. It's, it's a very genre-specific festival, which is funny because I feel like most of the films defy mm -hmm. a singular drama. Like, if you were pitching this, how would you describe it to people? Mm. Rust Belt Psychological Noir. Okay. I think that works. <laughs> I definitely think there is a lot of noir in this. It definitely yeah. has a lot of love for those old 50s noir films in just the way it's shot. It's very dark. It's very shadowy, and mm -hmm. which I love. I don't, I don't think there's enough films doing that, so I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> those, those were a huge inspiration, and I'm a huge noir guy, too. Uh, I love... I love 60s French noir, if I can sound really pretentious. Go for it. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, I was obsessed with Robert Bresson movies and, and then the 70s Jean-Pierre Melville movies. I just think that they're incredible with how subtle they are and how restrained they are with tension and making sure that the audience is kind of not pandered to, where it's just like, let the audience experience this stuff organically. Let them experience it in their own right without, you know, music cues telling them how to feel. Let them feel it on their own way. And those movies were the ones that I was just obsessed with watching this. And then there were some, I mean, there were, the 70s is, is the decade that I'm, you know, I kind of go back to every single time on something whenever I'm working on. And another one was Friends of Eddie Coyle. Yeah. The Peter Yates movie was just like, it's Robert Mitchum. I, mean, I don't know. I don't know if there's another performance like that of his. I feel like there's a lot of people right now that are going back to that 70s style. Like even in horror. Yeah. Horror's been a lot of yeah. 70s throwback vibe yeah. lately. There's something about... I don't know. I, somebody gave me some theory where it's like whenever we're in a time of very um, shitty societal circumstances, that's when the work starts getting really good because there's so much conflict. And, you know, after 68, there's just a horrible year and such a horrible time. That decade sort of got all that great work from it. Yeah. So, like, maybe this is the benefit of living in a time that's insane. Yeah. As the work goes there. So that nothing kind of imperfect but emotionally brutal way. Yeah, I definitely remember in November of 2016 feeling like at least movies and music are going to get yeah. really good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, I mean, there has to be something to make this worth it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting. So, what is the what what is the plan with the movie at this point? You're you're having the premiere yeah. here, and yeah. is there uh, a release? Okay. Um, I think we're. 
it's either the end of this year, by the way. This happened before where the lights turned off, so just be ready for it. I'm ready. It will happen, and then they turn back on. That's I think, fine. I think it might be a motion timer. Actually, dude, it's a motion timer. <laughs> this is great. Uh, so we got distribution, I think it's either end of this year or early next year. Okay. And is that, are you getting theatric release? Is it going to be a limited theatric? or limited theatric with like iTunes, and I'm fine with that. I just yeah. want as many people as possible to be able to see it. I um and I I hope that you take this as the compliment that I mean it for. But I think of a lot of the movies I've seen, I feel like this is one of those movies that will find its biggest benefit in a streaming service. For sure, it, it's yeah. that movie that like someone watches it on Netflix, yeah. goes holy shit, and then they tell a bunch of other people. I, I I take it as a huge compliment. I just want people to see it and enjoy it. And I think that you know I'm a huge I I have a friend who works for the company, but I'm like. I'm telling everyone I know to get that Apple TV 4K because I'm just like, I know that that format gives directors sort of peace of mind to know that you actually are getting the resolution and the color space that, you know, you obsess over in the grade. And so if everybody's going to watch it at home, it's like, awesome. Just watch it in the best possible format, which right now is that. Exactly. Um, so, uh, no, I... I I think that's great. If people want to watch it at home, that's awesome. And what's the um, the next step for you? Do you have the next movie idea yeah, in the brain? Yeah, yeah. Well, the script is done. Okay. Um, and that's sort of being put together right now, but it's bigger. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, all right, well, that was our chat, I guess. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, standoff at Sparrow Creek is going to be available sometime in the next couple months. Yes, I think with, I would say within the next like 90 days. Is there a website or a Facebook or anything where people can be kept up to date on stuff? That's a great question. I don't have any social media, so I don't know. <laughs> I would check the, uh, I would check the Cinestate, the producer's uh, website or okay. their Instagram. They're, they're pretty they're pretty on top of that stuff. All right, great. Well, guys, keep an eye and ear open. You're going to want to see this movie. You're not going to regret the experience. It, it's everything I love. It's it's a brisk movie. You know, you're not. It's you, quick. Yeah, it's a quick yeah, movie, and it, it start the the opening. I do want to say I love how it opens. Oh, thank you it, so much. It sets the tension. It sets the mood right out the gate, and then you're just kind of in for a very insightful conversation about violence for an hour and a half. I'll take that review. That's a great review. I appreciate that one. <laughs> Thank you very much. No problem. listening to the Geekscape Network. You're listening to the Geekscape Network.